In this video, we're going to continue looking at examples where we can represent a function with a geometric power series, but these are just going to be more difficult examples where we have to use some operations with the power series. As you can see, the structure of this question is exactly the same as the questions that we've been working through in our last video, but the problem comes with the fact that I know I want to be thinking about a over one minus r as what my series or my function will look like so that I can write the series as n goes from zero to infinity of a r to the n, where the absolute value of r is less than one. And as I can see, I don't have that here. So that's why this one's going to be tougher. It's going to require us to actually do the process twice. So I'm going to think about the fact that x squared plus two x minus three can be written as x plus three x minus one. Now, why is that important? Because of partial fractions. Oh, you thought you were done with them. You will never be done with partial fractions. I can say that f of x is the same as four x over x plus three x minus one. Now, that's not helpful because I'm still not where I want to be but I could be if I looked at partial fractions. So I'm going to call a the coefficient over x plus three and b the coefficient over x minus one. How do we do partial fractions? Well, what I do is I'm just gonna get rid of this f of x to make room. I'm going to take everything times that denominator, x plus three, x minus one x plus three, x minus one. Now on the left-hand side, as always, I'm going to just end up with whatever the numerator was, in this case, four x. On the right side, the x plus three would cancel, leaving me with a times x minus one. And for the b, the x minus one would cancel, leaving me with b times x plus three. So I'm going to assume you've used partial fractions before and not go through it in super duper great detail. Um, if you need super duper great detail, go back to a partial fraction video. From here, I can just make it easy on myself. So a lot of, there's two different strategies for solving a partial fractions question like this. Um, I like to take the one that takes less work. So I'm going to let say X equal one and if I do that, I'm going to get four times one or four is equal to a times x minus one or one minus one, which is zero. So I don't have to worry about that. Plus b times x plus three, so one plus three. So I get four is equal to four b and therefore one is equal to b. And then I'm going to take x is equal to three, I'm sorry, negative three, and again, why am I choosing these values? Because I'm looking at the zero product property that says if I let x equal one, then x, one minus one is going to equal zero. And if I let x equal negative three, then negative three plus three is going to be zero. So that's why I'm choosing those values so that I can solve this quickly. So four times negative three is negative 12, and that's equal to a times negative three minus one plus b times negative three plus three, and of course this one's going to cancel. So I get negative 12 is equal to negative four a, negative three minus one is negative four, which means three is equal to a. So what that tells me is I'm now dealing with a, which is three over x plus three, and then plus one over x minus one. So this is my new function. So I'm just rewriting it. So I had to do the partial fractions to get it to this point. So that means that is my function f of x. Now, what am I going to do from here? Well, what I can do from here is exactly what I've done on my previous questions. I just have two functions now and that's okay. So for my first function, Let's just look at them as, let's call this guy g of x. Let's call him g of x would be three over x plus three. So I'm going to work to get him into the form of a over one minus r. So I'm going to start by just switching the order, three plus x. 
And I don't want the 3 there, so I'm going to take it times 1 third. And I'm talking about this 3. We don't care what's on the top. 3 times 1 third is 1. 3 times 1 third is 1. And x times 1 third is x over 3. And then, of course, I'm going to think about the plus here as being minus a negative. So the reason I do that is, of course, so I know that a in this example is 1 and r is negative x over 3. And then I'm going to look at the other function. We'll call it h of x, which is 1 over x minus 1, which I can just rewrite as 1 over negative 1 plus x. And do I really want to leave it as negative 1 over negative 1 plus x? Well, I can just think of it as negative 1 over positive 1 minus x. So a is negative 1, and r is x. So from here, I can now think about how to put this all together. So I'm going to write my function, f of x, my original function, which was split into two parts as the power series from 0 to infinity of 1 negative x over 3 to the n. So I'm using the first values. And then plus the power series as n goes from 0 to infinity of negative 1 x to the n. Now I just want to do a little bit of cleanup. So I don't really care about the 1. And I don't really care about this negative 1 except that it's going to turn plus into minus. And so now I have the power series of the summation as n goes from 0 to infinity of negative x to the n over 3 to the n, or actually let's just split this up, negative 1 to the n, x to the n over 3 to the n, and then I'm subtracting x to the n. So it's the power series of all of that. Now, I'm going to take it just one step further and write it as the summation as n goes from 0 to infinity of, I'm just going to factor out my x to the n. Uh, let's put the bracket here and the parenthesis here. So that would give me negative 1 to the n over 3 to the n minus 1. So that is my solution. Now, the last thing I need to do is determine my interval of convergence. And my interval of convergence is going to be found by looking at each of the radii and what that interval of convergence would be. So let's see if I can create some space up here. So now I'm going to think about just using Okay, sorry, I should have had a better tool for that. Now I'm going to think about using that the absolute value of negative x over 3 has to be less than 1, and the absolute value of x has to be less than 1. So for my first one, if I rewrite it, I can say, well, that's the absolute value of x over 3 is less than 1, because obviously 3 is already positive, and I'm taking the negative off of the x. So that gives me the absolute value of x is less than 3, or negative 3 is less than x is less than 3. And for the second one, absolute value of x is less than 1 is just negative 1 is less than x is less than 1. So for my interval of convergence for the entire question, I have to make sure that it's true for all occasions. So I couldn't use this, negative 3 is less than x is less than 3, because that would not satisfy the other inequality. So my interval is simply going to be from negative 1 
to positive 1 because any value that's between negative 1 and positive 1 will also be between negative 3 and positive 3. Let's do just one last example, and this one's very, very similar to the example that we just went through, so if you're feeling up for a challenge, go for it on this one. Um, and if you're not feeling up for a challenge, that's okay. I'm going to take you through this one step by step. So the first thing is, hopefully the first thing that popped out at you is that x squared minus 1 can be written as x plus 1 x minus 1, which of course tells me that I'm going to have a partial fraction question again. I'm going to put a over x plus 1 and b over x minus 1 and solve. So by taking everything in that equation times x plus 1 x minus 1, I'm left with x is equal to a times x minus 1 plus b times x plus 1. Again, that's taking everything times x plus 1 x minus 1 and just canceling out factors that I can cancel. I'm going to again use the strategy where I come up with x values that are easy to work with. So if I choose x is 1, I'm going to get 1 for x and then a times 1 minus 1, which is going to go away, so a times 0, and then b times 1 plus 1 or 2b. So really I have 1 is equal to 2b and 1 half is equal to b. Using another value that's easy to work with is negative 1 because if I set x plus 1 equal to 0, I get negative 1. That's going to give me negative 1 is equal to a times negative 1 minus 1 or negative 2 plus b times negative 1 plus 1 or 0. So again, the b times 0 cancels out. I get negative 1 is equal to negative 2a and 1 half is equal to a. So my expression or my function f of x is now 1 half x plus 1 plus 1 half x plus, or I'm sorry, x minus 1. Now, each of these are a geometric series, um, but I don't have to do any work on the first guy because they tell me that if you have 1 over x plus 1, you can just rewrite it as the summation as n goes from 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, x to the n, which again, we could have very easily determined for ourselves using the same strategies that we've used. But why do extra work if we don't have to? So I'm going to keep the 1 half on the outside and write this as the summation as n goes from 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n, x to the n. For the second one, Really what I'm doing is exactly what I did on our last example. I'm going to think about 1 half x minus 1. I'm going to take the 1 half out of it. Usually I would leave it as a, but because I've got a 1 half here that I'm going to factor out, I'm just going to leave the a as 1. So I'm going to write this as 1 half times 1 over negative 1 plus x. But remember, I want it to be 1 minus x. So if I take everything times negative 1, I'm going to get negative 1 half, and I'm going to get positive 1 and minus x. So that's how I'm going to think about this, is minus 1 half. And then this guy is just the geometric sequence, which is the summation as n goes from 0 to infinity of a to the n, a now being 1, x to the n. So we're really close now, but now we just have to put everything together. And putting everything together would leave me with the 1 half, and then the summation as n goes from 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the n x to the n minus um, x to the n. Now again, this was 1 to the n, so if it helps you to think about 1 to the n, keep it in there for now. Because the next part is a new part, something we haven't had to do. Because I don't like this. This isn't clean for me. So I want to clean it up. And to clean it up, let's think about what some of the terms would be in the series. So I'm going to leave the 1 half out of it completely because that would just make things more complicated. Looking at this part of my function, what would be the first couple of terms? Well, if n were 0, that would give me negative 1 to the 0, which is 1, x to the 0, which is 1, minus 1 to the 0, x to the 0, which is also 1, which is a total of 0. Whoops. And then my next term, if n were 1, negative 1 to the first, and then x to the first, 
So that's negative 1x and then minus 1 to the first x to the first. So that's minus 1x. So that's a total of minus 2x's. And then if x were 3, I'm sorry, if x were 2, I would get negative 1 squared x squared. So that's 1x squared and then minus 1x squared. And we can see the pattern forming. And then I would get negative 1x cubed minus 1x cubed, which would be minus 2x cubed, and so on and so on. So what's the purpose of that? Well, I can see what's happening is I'm going to get a negative 2 and every odd power. So this is x to the first, x to the third. I would end up with plus 0 and then minus 2x to the fifth and so on. So I can rewrite this, keeping the 1 half on the outside, the summation as n goes from 0 to infinity of negative 2 and then x to an odd power. Now hopefully you remember that the definition of an odd integer is 2n plus 1. And so that's how I'm going to rewrite it. Now the last step is just to clean up the 1 half and the negative 2. So I'm going to rewrite this now as the summation, or 1 half, I'm sorry, not 1 half. 1 half times negative 2 is negative 1. So negative summation as n goes from 0 to infinity of x to the 2n plus 1. That is my power series. So if you were able to do that on your own, well done. The last thing I need to do is look at the interval of convergence. And we're going to do just as we did in the last one. We're going to compare the interval for each of the two separate series. So for the first series, it tells me that x has to be, or the absolute value of x has to be less than 1. And for that series, x was x. So for this series, absolute value of x has to be less than 1 which means negative 1 is less than x is less than 1. For the other series, this guy, the absolute value of r has to be less than 1, and r was equal to x, which means the absolute value of x has to be less than 1, and negative 1 is less than x is less than 1. And so for each one, the interval of convergence is the same, and therefore our interval of convergence is negative 1 to positive 1. Coming up next, we'll take a look at section 9.10, starting with the Taylor and McLaurin series.